there. Can we talk about Dino Sanctuary Volume 1? As I mentioned in past videos, with a few exceptions, there aren't a lot of animal-based anime or manga out there with an emphasis on animal education, and even fewer that actually go into the logistics of taking care of animals. The big exception being Aquatope on White Sands, and its views on animal husbandry are questionable. <laughs> jumped into my DMs and suggested I check out Volume 1 of Dinosaur Sanctuary, created by Itaru Kinoshita and distributed by Seven Seas Manga, I was skeptical but curious. Little did I know that Dino Sanctuary was everything I'd ever wanted in a manga about taking care of big, iconic animals. Only the first volume is out in English, with the second volume due in March, so instead of doing an overarching discussion of the franchise as a whole, I wanted to go through this first volume digital page by digital page. Um, if you'd like me to actually have a physical copy of the book, why not consider supporting me on Patreon? As little as $2 a month gives you early access to all my videos, and you'll be helping me out until I find gainful employment again. And talk about what really stood out to me to then this unique, but also familiar and charming manga. The premise of Dinosaur Sanctuary is fairly simple. Back in the 1940s, a lost world of sorts was discovered and dinosaurs were quickly introduced into society for the purpose of spectacle. There's some other details about genetically engineering dinosaurs, but basically we have dinosaurs now and we need a place to put them so they end up for all intents and purposes, zoos. Dinosaur Sanctuary follows Ricky Zoo, sorry, dino keeper, Suma Suzume, and her budding career at Enoshima Dinoland a dinosaur sanctuary on the verge of going under. While further volumes might have more of an overarching plot, the manga so far is very a slice of life, as Suzume learns the in and outs of dino husbandry and works to make Dinoland a thriving place. So right off the bat, we're introduced to two big things that made me realize everyone involved in this project knew what they were doing. The first one is the showing of a carcass feeding. While sometimes zoos call them the more public-friendly naturalistic feeding, it isn't unprecedented to give a carnivorous animal the entire body of an already dead animal to eat for enrichment and nutrition purposes. Note I emphasize already dead because we did carcass feedings for animals at my old zoo and you had to make that part clear because if you just said they were giving a Komodo dragon and goat, you had people expecting a Jurassic Park scenario. Where's the goat? This entire scene showed that Itaru Kinoshita clearly had a strong gasp of the workings of zoos and later details such as the use of dummy eggs a common practice in avian husbandry, where fake eggs are given for birds to brood on, and protected contact for the larger and more dangerous dinosaurs confirm this. And the second one is interpretation. There is a big misconception that interpretation just means translation, but in the world of museums, parks, and zoos, interpretation is a really essential skill that's strongly encouraged in its employees. It basically means how to convey information in a way that expresses a meaning, usually with a goal in mind upon someone obtaining this information. In a lot of zoos that emphasize interpretation, the goal might be to build empathy for an animal or species as a whole, and encourage guests to take action to help the species out. You can save these elephants by reducing your carbon footprint by buying a tote bag from our zoo gift shop. By the way, did you know the largest contributor of carbon emissions is the US military? Consider a reusable water bottle. So I was utterly delighted when our plucky protagonist Suzume uses interpretation skills to build up empathy with a distraught child and to educate the school group she's in. She says very early on her goal is to build a connection between people and dinosaurs, which isn't too far off from the goal most people who work in education in a zoo have. I personally think more zoos should be developing and building strong education and interpretation programs because teaching people to care is just really important from a humanity standpoint and also, and this goes into my next point, zookeepers suck. Oh, Senpai is so mean and horrible to me. But once I saw him feeding some stray kittens and he fought off some hooligans who were gonna mug me. So he's secretly kind. I normally hate this trope. I feel like most people who read manga are young and come from maladjusted homes and really don't need a message like someone who is mean to you is okay to be around. But I actually have no problem in terms of the narrative with Kaido doing this because this is exactly how zookeepers act. The work of a zookeeper is on par with what you might do working in a doggy daycare care and for about as much pay, but the majority of zookeepers who come in and stay in this field are mean. 
It's unusual for people starting out in this field to be bullied, picked on, or sometimes even full-on driven out of not just the zoo, but the zookeeping field in general. In my time working at a zoo, I lost track of how many people left due to not just the work itself, but just the behaviors of their supervisors and teammates. There were departments at my former job that were just full-on revolving doors. I'm not saying you can't start off as a zookeeper and find a good supportive team and mentors, but it's not super common. Zookeepers work a high-stress job for very little pay and have a, this is the way it's always been. I was pelted of elephant poop and called names when I first started out, you should be too, mentality. That unfortunately is not going away as quick as it should be. The side note here about the SWAT gear, I'm not sure it goes down at zoos in Japan, but I've never seen this when entering the same space as a potentially dangerous animal. I've seen helmets and safety glasses, but even in accredited AZA zoos when working with clearly very dangerous animals like crocodiles, this is just not a thing. But Japanese zoos go all out with their animal escape drills, so um, who knows? And while we're talking costume choices, it drives me crazy that they do the lab coat shorthand for doctor character design. I've never known anyone working in the world of exotic animal care who's ever worn a lab coat. I can't even remember the last time I talked with a domestic animal vet who wore a lab coat. Aquatope on White Sands did this too, but going back, I'm not really sure if they can be judged as experts on good animal care. <laughs> Zookeepers being assholes is also a big reason I feel interpretation is so important, because as shown at the start of the manga, Kaido also lacks the interpretive skills to really engage the public, and most zookeepers in the real world have the same problem. They're most likely in this line of work because they hate people, and have no capacity to answer such terrible questions from the public as, how old do the gorillas get, and where's the closest bathroom? The research done for Dino Sanctuary in regards to the dinosaurs themselves is incredible. It's so well done that paleontologist Shinichi Fujiwara who was the research consultant on this is credited as the co-creator, and in my opinion, rightfully so. It's wonderful to read his notes at the end of every chapter and see why he decided to have the Triceratops sit in a specific way based on his own studies. It also does not hurt that the editor and translator for the Western localization were really able to bring in some key terms and phrases used in Western zoos in this manga. Shinichi Fujiwara mentions the best way to understand dinosaurs is to look at present-day animals, so he is inspired by a lot of behaviors of birds and also crocodilians who are the closest step on the evolution ladder to birds. In this chapter, they mention that the male Trudons are the ones who brood their clutches. And this is actually a real trait that everyone's favorite murder bird, the cassowary, does. Fujiwara also talks about his choice to make dinosaur babies precocial, that's when baby birds are born cute, as opposed to altricial, where baby birds look like the bosses from Dark Souls games, cursed creatures left incomplete by a cruel god. It really delights me to see so much of this thought go into logistics of what it would be like to take care of a dinosaur. I feel culturally we like dinosaurs, but it's more in the same way children like dump trucks, big scary things that go There's so little we truly know about dinosaurs. We might not even be drawing dinosaurs right at all. Are you familiar with the shrink wrap theory? If we use the same method of figuring out what an animal looks like based solely on their skeletal structure, this is what an elephant would look like. To study the anatomy and behavior of birds and really show dinosaurs as complex and beautiful animals is great storytelling, which itself is an important part of interpretation. Speaking of interpretation. Chapter three introduces Masaru, a triceratops who broke his horn and has been treated as a defective commodity ever since on the verge of getting sent off elsewhere. Suzume and Masaru's primary Karin work together to develop signage to teach guests about Masaru, why he is missing his horn, and to build up connection and awareness for him. And I keep saying this, but it's a huge aspect of Dinosaur Sanctuary I love. That there is such a message in this manga, not just for the care for dinosaurs, but how to get people to care about dinosaurs. At my former job, the highlight of it was always creating that connection. People inherently love seeing lions and gorillas, but how do you get them to care about vultures? About snakes? It was always something I was so proud of at my job. I'd have guests come in and not know a thing about an animal and leave with a newfound respect and love for them. It makes me so happy that this manga can convey that sense of happiness I used to feel every day. I won't be the first person to review volume one of Dino Sanctuary and say it has a fun premise and is well researched and fantastically translated. Note to the translation team, please find an opportunity to include the phrase dino damage into further volumes. But for me, um, it's a wonderful look into the world of animal care and really places a beautiful and heartwarming emphasis on that need for outreach and interpretation when it comes to getting people to connect with creatures. I'm very excited to review volume two when it comes out. That's all for today. Thank you for letting me talk about Dinosaur Sanctuary volume one. 
Hi friends! So a lot has changed in the past few months. I unfortunately lost my job, so that means I'm more dependent on you all to help me as I attempt to find work again. This does however mean I'll probably be working on more frequent videos, so now more than ever it would be an amazing time to support me on Patreon. $2 a month will give you sneak previews to videos I'm making, get your name in the credits, and more than $2 will give you behind the scenes looks, let you vote on things, and even get a shout out for being one of my big spenders. Special thanks today for my big spenders, Kurt Schiller, Karas, and James Barrent, who requested I say, mm-mm, <clears throat> Garfield is me mum. $2 a month will give you sneak previews into all the videos I'm making, get your name in the credits, and more than $2 will get you behind the scenes looks and let you vote on things and even get a shout out for being one of my big spenders. So come on over to my Patreon. There are other ways you can help me as well. Buy me a Kofi or even just subscribe to my videos and share them around. I don't have a lot of reach on this thing, so the more shares I get, the better. Thank you all for your support as always. I'll be back soon. Take care, y'all.